button. And I'll just introduce us here. Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, Director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and today I'm here with Elizabeth uh, Morrison, and we're going to talk about empathy and how do we train and teach empathy. Uh, thanks for joining me for this discussion, just a wide-ranging discussion about our passion for empathy and training. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so um, I did look at your work. You know, you've, you've been doing uh, training, facilitating training with the Institute of uh, Healthcare Communication. Mm -hmm. So I, you have a bunch of videos and, you know, they're, they're, your training's kind of laid out systematically. I think there's like an hour webinar. And so there's going to be links, you know, to all that material in, in this video. So if people want to delve in deeper, they can, you know, check, you know, check that out too. So... That's uh, my son. Okay. <laughs> right, well, this is a casual conversation. <laughs> Somebody might come walking by here too. <laughs> so, how did you get in, in interested in empathy? Uh, and I saw you, you. You talked about Carl Rogers was uh, as like an influence for your uh, inspiration. Yeah, I mean, I think that I came to it as a kid like many of us do i wanted to ask you too how you came to your your passion for it and i think as a kid i came to it because i was um one of those kids like many of us who i think would have been described as sensitive or even overly sensitive and um felt uh really um sort of stung or lonely when i didn't feel heard or listened to and um i think that's true of most people I just remember having such an acute experience of what that feeling was. And I think, um, you know, uh, my uh, dad had alcoholism. So there was, you know, there was trouble in my family, like there is in many families. And I think I also had a very acute sense of when I saw other people who didn't feel heard or seen or, um, maybe respected, you know, all of these words that we sometimes use um, that are sort of descriptors maybe of how it feels when somebody um, empathizes with you. And it was, it was so stinging. Um, but I think I always had my sort of eye on it. And then uh, in my undergraduate uh, degree, I came across, it was in anthropology, but I came across Carl Rogers and that was really the first time, I didn't know I was going to be a therapist at that time, but it was the first time um, reading his work that I realized, oh, this is something that um, has a name and in some form can be quantified in a sense. Um, and that, um, that the, the receiver is the measurement of that. Mm -hmm. And... And then the fact that he was such a rigorous researcher. And so to see that this could actually be something that could be researched and, um, and then to see his sort of work in correlating the connection between therapist and patient or client and the correlation between the strength of that connection and clinical outcomes, I think that really started confirming something that I seen or felt myself um and hadn't really even known that someone could sort of put their finger on it and name it and research it and study it so so yeah that had a big influence on me mm. um and then i you know went on to um become a therapist and uh saw sort of the fruits of his work and other people doing more work and scott miller um, who I feel like right now, in terms of someone who's alive and working and contributing to the field, he's done this incredible work where he talks about the therapeutic alliance being um, this sort of uh, the biggest factor uh, in whether our clients get better or not. And then the sort of things that go into a therapeutic alliance. And of course, the biggest piece in that would be that feeling cared about. Um, so I feel, you know, then there's these other areas and I've actually been in the medical field now um, for many years, 13 years ago, I moved to California to start behavioral health services in a primary care system. We call them federally qualified health centers, like a community clinic setting. Mm -hmm. um, so treating people who are poor and underserved, undocumented, um, don't have insurance. 
um, I mean, in a sense, treating those who have been historically marginalized, um, where there's a lot of implicit and explicit bias probably around. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so the last sort of 13 or 14 years of my career have been really in primary care. Mm -hmm. And that's where I feel like I became kind of a warrior about this. Because warrior? The, yeah. Because <laughs> in the field of behavioral health, I wonder what your experience about this is. I feel like it is kind of a given. And this may be because Carl Rogers set that stage for us. It may be because there's always been an understanding that the relationship is part of the healing component when it comes to uh, talk therapy. And so I feel like in the behavioral health field, even if people aren't intimately familiar with the research and even if they have some different sort of, um, or, or maybe don't have highly developed or ideas about this, there's really an agreement um, that, that if you don't feel sort of cared about and heard by your therapist, they're not going to be able to be helpful to you. You know, you can't separate like we do in medicine. This person's a, gr um, a great therapist. Their bedside manner is just really poor. You know, I mean, there's no, we, we never separate that in therapy. Um, but, but when I got this, you know, 13, 14 years ago, when I moved here and got into the primary care culture, yeah, it made me become a real warrior because, that is in no way assumed there. The treatment is absolutely assumed to be the medicine and the procedure. Um, so that idea that the relationship is the context in which any change occurs is not a given. And so having to figure out ways to articulate it and share the research, which there's a ton of, of course, mm -hmm. in a way that feels meaningful to people, um, and in a kind way that doesn't feel like we're sort of hitting people over the head or proving that we're right. Um, and trying to figure out how to build systems within primary care that support relationships and skillful empathy conveyance. Um, that's really where I feel like I'm living now. Yeah, well, I could maybe share a little bit uh, about myself yeah. uh, to just, I, uh, I know you're, you're from, uh, oh, you're in Modesto uh, now, which is the California mm -hmm. Central Valley. I grew up in Sacramento, so oh. kind of not far from there in the San Francisco Bay area now near Berkeley. But, uh, you know, my, I grew up in a really uh, fundamentalist, you know, Christian household. And, you know, it's a very caring uh, sort of a family environment. But it's like you just can't say anything you want. You just can't, you know, you just don't really kind of get heard and seen and acknowledged for just whatever is up. There's a lot of things that kind of, kind of, uh, and are just not really shared or talked about. And, but uh, when I was, uh, I, I graduated early when I was about uh, 17, you know, from high school, just kind of got out early. And I ended up uh, traveling, spent about 10 years traveling around the world. But someone that I became friends with was uh, someone who was just like very empathic. Like I could just say anything I wanted to. And it was like, wow, this is really great. You know, this is, can do, we can talk. We talk, you know, for hours and hours and hours about just whatever kind of came up. And I didn't have the word uh, empathy at that time, but I knew sort of the, the quality of it, of kind of being heard and just kind of being able to be open. And then, you know, in you know, I went into technology, went and did a lot of uh, other things working in Silicon Valley, but then I wanted to do some, make some uh, documentaries, you know, about human values. And, uh, you know, I did some different projects and then it was around the time George Bush was in office and he kept talking, they kept, at that time, they were talking about conservative values. So I said, well, what are, I'm progressive, what are progressive values? And I started digging into it, and that's where I first kind of came across, you know, words like uh, empathy and, and, you know, hearing people's stories about it and, uh, you know, just kind of exploring it. And I kind of got deeper and deeper into it. And there were, uh, you know, kind of academics like George Lakoff, who wrote about empathy being a core progressive value. And I dug into it, became you know, more familiar with the uh, empathy community, everything from NBC to the you know, therapy community. And I said, wow, this is really great. <laughs> this, is, this is like you know, kind of core to what you know, I'm about. You know, having traveled and been through all these different cultures, I just kind of saw it's really about human connection that was really what was important. 
And so that was um, probably about 13 years ago. And uh, then shortly after that, uh, Barack Obama started running for office. And he went on and on and on about uh, the country had as an empathy deficit. So I said, okay, I'm going to really, you know, kind of work on this, kind of throw myself into it. And uh, started, you know, interviewing people online. Uh, those like those two rows of books are all books on empathy. I probably interviewed, you know, most of them. So it was like, you know, 300 interviews with uh, people, you know, empathy, you know, experts, what have you. And so I've just been kind of learning and, you know, getting deeper and deeper into it and starting to see that uh, what we really need, what I see is a culture of empathy, you know, a culture that, uh, you know, you're, you're working within the healthcare field, but it's really, you know, in schools and the, just the larger political, you know, social political culture is we need to kind of expand this empathic uh, listening and connection. And because it's really sort of the, the, the way that we kind of work through, connect with each other and work through problems and, uh, you know, problem solve and, you know, can really kind of address everyone's, uh, you know, experience and needs. So. So I've just been throwing myself into it. And every time I come across someone who's like an empathy enthusiast like yourself, I say, oh, I got to talk to them. <laughs> got to gotta connect. Got to, you know, kind of hear what, you know, what their story is and, you know, what their insights are. So, um, so and then the latest uh, for us, for me now, is the training. So I was especially of interest that, uh, you know, you've done a lot with training and, you know, you're a therapist, consultant, and a trainer, too. And you're doing that training with the Institute for Healthcare Communication. They, they have the empathy effect, I guess, that's the name of your training. And so just curious about, you know, the training you're doing. How is that working? Kind of where do you see it going? And, and yeah. Yeah, you know, um, thank you for telling me something about about yourself and kind of how you came to this i i appreciate hearing that and hearing um the different ways that we come into it and i think that's interesting this piece about sort of george bush and this idea of hearing this sort of conservative values and wondering well, what are what are progressive values and especially and then you know he, talking about obama kind of using the word right using the word empathy and then the place that we're at now i think it is a really interesting way uh time and way to think about what we're talking about in the um political arena which is a relationship arena <laughs> um, yeah. so i appreciate that i think that um i ran i was the director of a treatment center for adolescents in alaska which is where i'm from um uh and it was for adolescents who had a addictive disorder and they also had a severe behavioral problem. So what we call dual diagnosis in my field, it was residential and it was for six or seven months and there was sort of intensive group therapy and all kinds of treatment going on. And um, I remember that I'm uh, 48. That was, I was about 30 then. So it's almost 20 years ago now. And I remember having this idea in my mind that, you know, when I would watch interactions happen, sometimes in group therapy, I could, I could see um, that interaction go poorly. You know, the relationship between people sort of get wounded. And then in trying to sort of unwind that, you could see or um, you could hear maybe from someone who looked like they had sort of done the wounding, that in their heart, you know, they felt a lot of care and concern for this person and they wanted to connect with them or say something kind that would add to the connection not not wound it um and i think what back then when i was running that treatment center i really started to wind around this idea that um that you know that some of us can come by being able to sort of show and convey effectively empathy we might come by it naturally or we may have grown up in families that seem to do that with us skillfully. And so we sort of pick that up. Um, and, or we may have gotten professional training around that, which therapists do get a fair amount of professional training in about that, although it's not named as such really. If we call it sometimes rapport building. Um, and so I started to think in this treatment center, maybe we need to have an empathy training 
for these kids. Mm -hmm. So that if they really are mad at someone and are want to wound that relationship, <laughs> that's certainly their choice. Um, but what, what about when they want to strengthen a connection and they just don't have the skills to be able to do that in the moment? You know, they're giving advice to somebody or reassuring them, which neither one of which feel empathetic or, you know, add to relationships. They feel a little dismissive, even though that's not usually the intention. And so I started doing a one hour a week training um, for those uh, adolescents. And I, and we called it just empathy training, oh, wow. mm -hmm. essentially some of these skills. And I think that was the first time that I tinkered with this idea um, that um, this could be like anything else, you know, if we treat, if we treat, mm -hmm. you, know, you go to school, you learn how to take a blood pressure, you learn how to take a temperature, you learn how to do vitals when you're going to become a medical assistant. And, you know, everybody who goes into a profession gets sort of these skills and that, um, why couldn't this sort of be taught in the same way? And I also felt like it, it sort of got at this myth that either you're sort of a nice person or you're not. You know, and, and it, it didn't, it's sort of, um, I think this idea that I'd like to sort of assume we all, we all have empathy, um, except for this very, very tiny percentage, you know, of sociopaths, this is very tiny percentage that we all have it. Um, and so we don't need to sort of judge people and say you're nice or you're not nice or something. Uh, but really, it's really just a, a, a skills issue or mm -hmm. a resource issue. Uh -huh. And it sort of took the, I feel like it takes the edge off of like sort of a character judgment or something. And, uh, and so, so then much later, once I got into primary care, I started, uh, became a motivational interviewing trainer. Motivational interviewing is, you know, it's a specific kind of uh, therapeutic strategy. And, um, uh, it's, you know, incredibly well researched. It's sort of been researched with, you know, clinical trials, the same way you would research blood pressure medication. Um, there's been sort of over 70, I think, clinical trials of this particular strategy. Um, it's very, very helpful in helping people change. And when you look at motivational interviewing and sort of the, you know, original founders, Rollinick and Miller, and you look at their research and their books right up till present, the bulk of this strategy is around deeply connecting with people and really losing our agendas for what we think they should do. And then a series of kind of strategies around eliciting from them, you know, what are their beliefs and what is meaningful to them? And these sorts of, you know, it's just a skill of asking open-ended questions and, um, so I, you know, I would sort of been doing that for a number of years and I felt myself in these trainings focusing much more on those skills of sort of open-ended questions and really looking for people's strengths and being able to repeat them back to them and reflective listening and these skills that can't be applied like a recipe in any ingenuine way and work. Um, Cause that would be the criticism, right? Is that it's sort of this old joke about, marriage therapist forcing you know this married couple to say to each other i hear what you're saying and repeat everything back or that there's something kind of just inauthentic or um trickster like about it or something and um that's certainly not the spirit of it it's this idea that you know that urge that we have in our hearts to be helpful to people whether we do it professionally or just because we want the people we love and our friends in the world to be the best that they can that we could add to our resources and skills and be able to do that more skillfully. And then as a result of that, we end up feeling more connected to people and have more rewarding interactions and have less stress because when we're trying to, when we have an agenda kind of trying to move people the way we want them to move, it's kind of stressful and it's really hard to really connect to them because um, we're busy trying to control them. And uh, like when you described your friend when you were traveling and that experience you had where you could sort of say anything, um, I often say that empathy is the opposite of judgment. And so it's a little seesaw-like that if we're sort of judging what somebody is saying or doing, um, you know, the empathy is, is low. And the higher our empathy is, um, the less we're judging. So the more we're accepting. And not, uh, and we can do things to sort of 
show people or make clear to people that that's what we're doing with them. Um, and so that's really what the empathy effect grew out of is I start, I became a faculty member and a master trainer for the Institute for Healthcare Communication because the great majority of their workshops are all based on this um, empathetic relationships, developing empathetic relationships uh, for and, and all within healthcare. And so uh, Blue Shield of California, which is a health foundation in California, a very forward thinking health foundation, um, I had been working with them before and the program officer and I had a real connection around this empathy stuff. And she said, why don't you, why don't you develop a new curriculum mm, wow. that is not just based on these skills, but is just these skills. And, um, all of the workshops, you know, uh, all this, the work, the empathy effect workshop is incredibly research based. It's very rigorous in that sense that, even though for most of us, I think these things, you hear them and you think, oh, that makes such sense, you know? Now I know why when somebody says, you know, what are your thoughts about that? Why that feels good? Well, it's an open-ended question that's listening, you know, your thoughts before they give you advice. Um, so I think that intuitively the things that, you know, really make sense to us or we sort of know feel good or the things that feel bad and we sort of shy away from, um, we can recognize them in this workshop. I also, I think it adds an a kind of an academic piece or a strength to the workshop that it's very, very tied to the research because there is huge amounts of research on this, um, not just in the healthcare field or in the social sciences field, in every field. And I do feel like those sort of, uh, we have sort of silos of research. Mm -hmm. And which is very problematic because then we don't get to see the real breadth and depth and the larger picture in the research about empathy. Um, so we did try to incorporate from other fields as much as we could. So we didn't have that sort of carpet mentalized um, effect. Um, but it, it, it was about a year and a half in the making. And I had a partner, Michelle Nanchoff, who's also a master trainer for the Institute for Healthcare Communication. We both have a really deep passion for this. And we just spent, um, you know, endless time researching and trying to figure out, um, it's a, it's a train the trainer course. So in addition to figuring out what content, you know, do we want to sort of have in here? We also wanted to figure out what can we teach other people to deliver? And um, what, what sort of is too much content where people don't take, in, take away enough? Because I think we want to make sure that we deliver the workshop in a way that's consistent with the empathetic principles that we're teaching. Mm -hmm. And so just in the way that if you go to see your doctor and they don't let you talk because they have so much they need you to know. <laughs> And they sort of give you a ton of information, probably for good motive. Um, and you leave there and it's too much. There's only a couple things you remember. It wasn't the information you wanted because you didn't get a chance to say what was really troubling you, what you really need. And they didn't ask you any questions. And then you leave there saying, ah, doctors, they didn't even listen to me. You know, I just, I don't, I don't even know what to do now. And so we didn't want to have a course like that. Mm -hmm. we dumped at people and so we tried to model the workshop on really eliciting heavily from participants so that there's not just interaction but in some ways it's driven by participant contribution and also that there's big blocks of practice because most of us particularly in the healthcare field i would say when we say, let's practice open-ended questions, 99% of us say, oh, I do that all the time. It's really easy. And then when we sit down to practice, um, maybe two out of three of the questions are closed, you know? And so that's true, I think, with all of the skills that we talk about. And it's true for me, too. I mean, I've been consciously practicing, affirming, really trying to hear someone's strength and be, before I follow, or if I ever follow the pathology or the problem that they're sharing, that I really see and acknowledge and repeat back and share back what I see is the strength. I've been consciously practicing just that skill for probably 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I still catch myself in a therapy session or with my children 
And I've completely missed it. And I just think, how did I follow that problem into the ground to the point that now, you know, my daughter's saying, oh, I don't want to talk about this anymore. And I think, oh, where did that go wrong? You know, I mean, these things are, I, I think that's the message that we wanted to convey is that we're not experts. We're, we're continual practicers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it you takes know, an ongoing uh, learning. Yeah. It's not, not like you can take a couple hour workshop and suddenly you're this great empathic listener it's like this ongoing sort of way of developing that uh that uh way of being and yeah and ongoing. yeah yeah and so you, you had to conceive as well as initiate this training then so so wow yes uh -huh. yes and i don't think there's um anything like it no to be honest no. and and i think there was like there's a couple things in addition to the content itself, I think there's a couple of things that I'm really proud of that make a different. Um, I mean, one of them is that the Institute for Healthcare Communication is a nonprofit. And that feels important to me because I've always worked in nonprofit healthcare. And the other thing is, is that we, the research that is out there specifically in the medical field, which of course, as I said, there's just a ton of, it's very physician focused. And mm -hmm. focused on the physician and their empathy and connection to the patient. And some of the work I did at my community clinic um, seven and eight years ago when I was on senior leadership there is I became deeply interested in reception, receptionists, and the impact that receptionists' empathy conveyance or lack of impacted patient outcomes. And this is an area that I think is really interesting to me in healthcare, but also in um, commercial or, or, or the retail field, is medicine is very hierarchical. It's traditionally been very patriarchal. It's, it's um, very hierarchical um, as a field. And our focus has been like a laser on the physician. And that unfortunately has held true even when we're studying things that are would not be considered traditional like empathy and relationship that 90 percent of the research is on the physician mm -hmm. my experience though when i go to the doctor or when i take my kids to the doctor is that the if the trash can outside the door is overflowing and if i walk in and the receptionist says sign in no greeting just sign in and they don't look up and they don't smile and then i sit down in a waiting room that has you know some blaring tv and some crackers on the ground with a bunch of other patients where we're very isolated from each other it's not a warm environment we don't look at each other you know we we, we just all look down because the organization itself has not created an environment where it is conducive to us acknowledging each other because they don't acknowledge us. And if that happens, and then I wait for a long time, and there's a lot of research on this, wait time itself does not correlate to a poor experience. A wait time where you feel ignored, where nobody let you know that the wait would be that long. Nobody came to you and said, I'm sorry the wait was this long. Nobody came to you and said, it looks like it's gonna be another half an hour. Can I get you some water? You, you're just completely ignored. And you have to assume you're being forgotten, which is why people have to go up to the front and say, did I get forgotten or how much longer? Um, and then I get called in by a medical assistant who actually doesn't speak to my son directly, like as if he's not a person, and he's not there and does his vitals and looks down at her computer. And even before we had computers, they looked down at files. And then the physician comes in and the physician perhaps is fairly friendly, does a little better. I still dread returning to that place. Hmm. I don't want to go there. And yeah. the way that that ends up affecting treatment outcomes is I won't go there then until the stress of the problem I'm having outweighs the discomfort and the, um, coldness and lack of care or connection I feel at that office. It really has to outweigh it. And so that's why I became really deeply interested in how organizations convey empathy and yeah. what the physical space looks like. And, you know, we know there's research on magazines that, you know, if there are old torn up magazines, then that affects the level of confidence that the patient has 
um, on, on, the, on the healthcare team, which we know that's true. You walk into a dentist's office with a bunch of old magazines that are torn up, you think, oh no, whether unconsciously or consciously. And so like the environment, whether it looks cared for, um, whether the receptionists look like, you know, they're treated like people and then they treat us like people or whether we're, we're all sort of widgets on the conveyor yeah. belt, you know? Well, that's sort of moving into the design for the uh, Cleveland Clinic's uh, empathy and innovation is there's this uh, empathy component of, of, of the listening and, and you're, you're talking about um, Bill Miller, you know, with, yes. I don't know if you saw yes. his new book out. Yes, but, I did. Okay. Yes. So, um, you know, we're talking about the empathic listening and the motivational interviewing, but there's sort of a whole arc of uh, where sort of I've been moving into is that is building a culture of empathy. So looking at the cultural uh, component, and I think that whole part of uh, design and human-centered design comes into uh, what you're talking about, the, the yeah. full experience um, coming into a healthcare you know, into a facility, even before you even go, the selection process, just the whole experience and how to design a more empathic uh, ex experience um, from, the, from the, sort of from the get-go. Uh, yeah. Someone I just interviewed, I don't know if you saw that interview with uh, um, Ventura, Michael Ventura, He's, he wrote a book, uh, Applied Empathy. So he has a design company in New York. And he got a, he, they got a contract uh, from uh, GE. They were looking at uh, their imaging business, which was for mammogram. They have some, you know, uh, machines that do the x-rays, they ask for mammograms. And so GE, they were kind of losing business in, in that area. So they uh, hired them to kind of study, how do we, you know, promote our, our mammogram imaging business more? And so they, their design company, they, they created, a, they rented a space, they brought in healthcare workers, they brought in just people from the community, you know, women to just have dialogues about the experience. And they talked about specifically that, like the magazines, you know, there were old two-year-old magazines or whatever in, in the waiting room. So, and so they kind of redesigned the full experience and that uh, GE turned into not just selling their, um, uh, mammograms, but creating, selling the full experience, so creating a full uh, center that was sort of a reproducible center that, that, that could be purchased. And so where they thought about all the whole, you know, the whole process, um, even everything yeah. to the temperature, the temperature of the room. Temperature. You know, I read it, about the temperature. And I have to tell you, I think this idea that you're talking about that the applied um, um, Em empathetics Implied Applied empathy is yeah, a, book. a New York yeah. company that consulted on this um, and you know when I was talking about receptionists and what the Cleveland Clinic's doing I think this is actually in terms of a social justice movement is radical because in addition to thinking about relationship centered care what it does is it flattens the hierarchy because instead of saying um, because uh, empathy is the great equalizer so it means that you're in my field the medical assistant and the receptionist actually have equal impact mm -hmm. and, and and there's some early research showing there at this and of course I'm doing the research now because I always want to do the research that I'm always looking for <laughs> because there hasn't been as much in this area we know, though, from, nurse, from research on nurses that their impact on patients' treatment outcomes, their impact on patient experience, which is related directly to treatment outcomes, outweighs the physician in the hospital. So we know that. We know that in inpatient settings that aren't hospitals, so residential treatment centers, uh, uh, um, residential uh, boarding cares and things like that, that the nurse outweighs the physician in terms of their impact on the patient's experience. And so, and I think we have some emerging research to show that medical assistants and receptionists impact on patient experience and patient outcomes are equal to or higher than the physician. And so I think like that, 
as a larger um, comment on sort of hierarchy or where we've chosen to place importance, how we pay these very low wage workers who are primarily women. And um, in California and in many places, they're primarily women of color. I think that that has implications there too. Mm-hmm. That once we start saying relationships are deeply important, then we have to start, you know, and we say, and the research is very that and the money sort of follows that at, you know as GE clearly saw when they contracted this consulting company then you have to sort of you know follow that to the trickle down to then who are the people in the organization that have the most impact on how they sort of convey this or do this and it's going to be your lower paid workers so should they really be the mm-hmm. lowest workers um, I, I waged a very unsuccessful um, campaign for doubling the hourly wage of the receptionists in my community clinic. And that's very complex. It's a very complex way, you know, thing to wage. And it was highly unsuccessful. Um, that was really my point though, is there, this is really the most important person in terms of setting the tone, answering the phone, they spend the longest with the patient because we wait about 45 minutes in a waiting room and we see physicians for about eight minutes. So they own the public space that has the biggest impact in terms of how people actually feel about the organization. And so I do think there's some social justice pieces here when we start prioritizing relationships, not to mention the fact that relationships and relational skills are largely sort of the archetype of the feminine and not necessarily of women, but of the feminine. And because I think we have so devalued the feminine and so overvalued what we consider masculine, which would be sort of content or what we call objective as if there could be, um, that we've ended up with these systems then that overpay and overvalue those typically masculine skills yeah there's uh the kind of the aspect of the social uh, justice um is what i've been thinking about is what we really need is a sort of a social empathy kind of a new framing that social justice has sort of been taken over by in fact it's not revolutionary enough in the sense of about that equality that you're talking about that it still holds a lot of the, the core principles, uh, the, the existing principles. So there's a book out called Entangled Empathy by, um, uh, oh, I can't. Anyway, she's a professor at Wellesley University, which is a real center for women's study, and has been talking about this uh, relational uh, component, relational empathy, especially in the health, in the therapeutic world so the, the notion is is that the therapy was you know started by men the whole field so it has a lot of the underlying principles or values you know of autonomy uh, having you know kind of general looking for a general truths or principles you know versus the context of what's sort of happening um, and and you know sort of autonomy and things like that versus the relationality so anyway they've kind of done a lot in, in terms of the study saying, hey, there's a problem with the whole therapeutic, you know, premises foundation. What we really need is more of this relational empathy is sort of this foundation. And she does a really nice job of contrasting kind of an ethics of justice and an ethics of empathy and care. And it's sort of, it's sort of what you see in the justice system. I mean, the justice system is not, I would not say, is a very empathic uh, container you know it's like it's based on it's based on competition we're going to get to the truth by you hire this gladiator called the lawyer and they kind of battle it out it's external judgment it's retribution and a whole set of uh, underlying uh, principles that i would say is not really the empathic model which would be more of a restorative you know restorative justice kind of comes in to that more where it's really everyone kind of hearing and dialoguing and sort of working out the problem and coming to some kind of a shared understanding and shared, uh, uh, you know, direction that we're, we're going to go. So the whole, 
concept of, of uh, social justice I'm kind of skeptical of, that it's almost, to me, it seems like it's almost kind of beyond, um, you know, generally kind of redemption <laughs> in, a, in a sense that it, it's, it has a, it, uh, it's so grounded in, in these other principles versus an empathic principle. And politically, politically, it's also very grounded in identity politics now. And we've been doing a lot of work, you know, with trying to mediate between the political left and right in our empathy tent. Um, and we've done mediation to some of these uh, battles for Berkeley. I don't know if you've- Yes, I have been following that. Yeah, so as these knock down, drag out fights, we got our empathy tent there. We've actually been, you know, doing empathic listening and mediation in those environments. So it seems that there's a whole new um, sort of a cultural frame that we can create around empathy, this basic, uh, um, you know, is, is, a, is a foundation of empathy and, and, and of, care, of care, which kind of stems from, from that uh, connection. So that's kind of what we've been, uh, you know, working on. Um, I love so. the empathy tent. Definitely, I've been, or have, you know, for the last, I guess, year or whatever, making sure to sort of follow that. And I've seen some of the articles that have come out of that. I think that what you're, this is why it's really fun to talk to people who are interested in this. Um, I hadn't heard of that angled empathy book or the professor at Wellesley. Um, and uh, I, I would love to read that. And I think that's so interesting what you were saying that perhaps social justice, it sounds like what you were saying that social justice, the way we typically use the term or the dominant discourse about what it is, is based on sort of a set of assumptions and principles that may not be um, what we might consider empathic principles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so, um, yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. I think one of the things, and, and, and the empathy effect workshop, um, uh, about half of it is about this, is about bias. And one of the things that we sort of group together in the workshop, which I think can be argued, we made a decision to group together bias, judgment, stereotypes, and stigma. And I do think that there are different definitions to those words. Um, we wanted to sort of group them together in the same way that we grouped a lot of things together with empathy, because we didn't want to get stuck on dividing up these very intricate definitions. And we wanted sort of people to have an agreement about generally what that means. But the reason that we wanted to include bias in that is because we sort of talk a lot about and I'm connecting this to the, how we currently think of social justice but, and the identity politics that you mentioned that we may, um, that we're in right now. But I think that idea of acknowledging that bias is like judgment in the sense that when, you know, that we all have bias, we all have it. And much of it is explicit. And some of it's implicit, maybe unconscious. And if we're not sort of committed to having a moment of sort of self-reflection, which is, this is what we did in the workshop, is we tried to tie to the research and make it really practical about how we can identify when we're having bias. And we can't always do that because we don't always have a conscious thought. Many of us, though, have particular, um, you know, uh, body reactions or wanting to leave interactions or um, not wanting to, or, you know, stopping breathing or sort of holding our breath or dreading seeing somebody or um, feeling very dismissive, particularly dismissive or something. And so, and then we, we sort of give ways um, to counter bias in the moment so that we are not acting on that. And I feel like now at this time in our culture and sort of the discourse that we're in right now, that's a, it's a really important idea. And it gets back to what I was saying in the beginning that I think by talking about empathy as sort of, um, or empathy conveyance as sort of skills that we can mm -hmm. learn or employ or practice. Um, and let's assume that we're sort of all 
generally speaking, empathic people who are sort of born to connect with each other. Um, I feel like if we can normalize bias and judgment in that same way, we all have bias and judgment and we, most of us came by it honestly, <laughs> you know, sort of cultural, family, church, you know, you name it. Um, and because then it, it sort of takes the self judgment mm -hmm. out of being willing to sort of wonder what, you know, what is, what is going on for me here? And um, sort of take the judgment out of judgment. Yeah. Uh, judging <laughs> judge. Yes, <because laughs> Creating also, layers yeah. of judgments. That's exactly right. Cause I think yeah. if, if we have a lot of judgment about ju our judgment, then it doesn't allow us to look at it. Yeah. It, to sort of normalize it. And it doesn't allow us to have conversations about it. Um, you know, just when I'm interviewing, you know, if I have someone that I feel like I trust that I'm interviewing with, and I say, hey, this is really complicated to talk about. Can we sort of check ourselves around bias? You know, we have a team of white interviewers, white women interviewers. <laughs> Do we want to, can we talk about this? And can we think about, um, we don't have to judge each other or make big pronouncements or be self-righteous or self-loathing. Can, can we sort of externalize this and just sort of... Um, talk about it and figure out how we can put in systemic ways to make sure that bias isn't the decision maker here, but also to kind of self monitor. Um, and that's sort of the message of the empathy effect. We all have mm -hmm. bias. They deeply affect how we treat people and how we treat people deeply affects their health outcomes. And so it is our duty as people who work in the healthcare field then to have tools to um, notice bias and to mitigate it. Mm -hmm. So be aware that there is bias. Don't judge your bias. Become aware of it and then have ways of uh, addressing the, the bias. Yeah. So in that workshop, we actually have convert. I mean, every workshop is different. Um, I, there's conversations that come up about race and what we've learned in our families and, um, you know, what kind of trauma people have experienced. And uh, so we, we, we have a lot of, you know, we help the facilitators a lot sort of navigate those conversations. Um, but it does bring, it does bring those things right into the room when you start talking about that. I saw that in some of the webinars that people were sharing their sense of, oh, it, feeling that they were, that the relationship was based on racism and then they're kind of like questioning uh, but is that really what's happening here? Am I just kind of assuming that and sort of kind of exploring uh, those those thoughts that come up and having a, a safe place to be able to share and have those thoughts uh, be heard? Yeah. The, the one thing in terms of the training, like I'm starting to work on a, developing a training now, like we'd like to create a online um, sort of a, Train a MOOC, an empathy training MOOC, you know, the massive online open uh, course, and something that it would be read easily accessible, you know, online, and that uh, the way it would be taken is you could you form a group or a team and you take it together, and then the core process is uh, what I call an empathy circle, which is mutual empathic listening. So we have small groups. And we do mutual empathic listening with each other with sort of like a turn taking uh, process and um, and it's framed within the idea of how do we create a culture of empathy you know how do we really transform society to have that empathy as a foundational value and we're what we're doing is using the book listening well as um, as uh, you know it's got sixteen chapters so we're forming teams you know to and we, do, we take a chapter and then we uh, do, uh, discuss it using empathic listening. So every lesson, you know, he's adding another piece to the, you know, to the deepening of the empathic listening process. And then we use empathic listening and we've got just forming a third design team uh, right now where we, we kind of do it as well as try to divide, design activities to kind of add and then create this online uh, course. And so, but it's framed around that culture of empathy in, you know, that's, it seems that, I mean, it, like you're, you talked about the silos, right? There's the silo of, of uh, 
the healthcare, there's the silo of education. And it's, it's like the communities are, it's like, it's, it's like all the principles are seen to be really the same principle between all of these. And it doesn't, you know, even in, in business or whatever, it's not so much seen that there is really this commonality of these uh, principles. And can we create sort of a, you know, a common tool set kit to kind of, to, that anybody could kind of use. So that's kind of the, the current uh, project that we're So the hope is on. it would be, it would really be just transdisciplinary. Yeah. It could be in any field or in any discipline. I love that idea. And then also uh, in getting into the political realm, or if you saw the radical empathy forum that we did. I did. Um, yeah, so we're having the politicians actually do, you know, mutual, and, and that's what we were doing. They're having an empathy circle. So we had 11 candidates. We divided them into two groups, and for an hour, they all talked about how do we create a culture of empathy. So, and then they used empathic listening for the dialogue as well. So they were kind of generating ideas as well as kind of using empathic listening. So. I was kind of excited about it. I just was just mentioned again on the radio here on KQED, you know, PB, uh, NPR radio. They mentioned it a second time saying, oh, yeah, this thing, it's something new, you know. Berkeley's That's always great. a cutting edge for new ideas. So, so hoping to kind of, kind of, kind of spread that. Um, Are you connected in any way to the Greater Good Science Center? Um, I know of them and, you know, I've talked with them, uh, you know, knew the editor, you know, we get together for lunch or something, but haven't, they, they've kind of focused more on, I would say, compassion kind of mm -hmm. aspect. Yeah. There seems to be, it's a little bit like the book, uh, The Compassion Connection. Mm -hmm. Uh, there seems to be these different communities, you know, one is sort of this compassion uh, with the core practice of meditation and right. then more of the therapeutic kind of world, which is based on the empathic listening. And there seems to be a little bit of a, and, and I had a big, you know, discussion with uh, David Rakel about that too, uh, where, you know, some of the studies, I think with the compassion community, like there's one from Tanya Singer in from Germany, that's kind of critical of empathy, saying, oh, you know, compassion is better than empathy. And, um, you know, I've had big discussions with Helen Reese, you know, from uh, Empathicus, Empathetics, you know, the other training, right, about just, you know, these studies, it, you know, it, it has real problems. So anyway, we had a real knockdown track <laughs> chat about that. So it was very yeah. good. It was kind of that, fun. That area is a big, can be very divisive. Yeah. The yeah. Other, I mean, I think the area that's related directly to that, that can be very divisive is this, um, uh, that sort of perception or definition of empathy as feeling what others feel. Yeah. And, um, even as a as a sort of lay person, that's the first thing I would say that I run into is people say, "Oh no no no, I'm already too empathetic." I mean, yeah. I already, you know, I'm drained at the end of the day. I already help too much. I already can't say no. You know, I mean, this whole package of things that come with that idea that empathy is narrowly defined as what we would consider um, affective empathy and not just affective empathy where I'm actually feeling what you're feeling, but affective empathy that's intolerable to me. So it's sort of the triple whammy. Um, but I think that that is at least, I would say in the healthcare field in general, that is the overarching definition or perception of empathy. And I mm. think really even some academics or people who work in the field who define it that way. And I do think that that's, problematic I yeah, mean, biologically speaking mm -hmm. right when we look at um sort of biology and these early baby studies and about feeling pain when others feel pain and animals and things like this i think there's absolutely something to that but i think to define it that way when we're trying to work with it in a relational context is really narrow and yeah. really, really really uh worrisome to the field because when my son ran down my mom's driveway and skinned his knee, when he comes back in 
And she, I can see a level of affective empathy that she has for a little boy, like really wailing with this wound. Um, and it's clearly intolerable to her. So her first response is, why were you running? And then, you know, you have 20 of those incidents between the two of them. And that relationship is wounded. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it is a relationship now characterized by those micro interactions that are judgmental, that are unkind. Um, and it's really not because my mom wasn't feeling empathy in that very narrow way. She was feeling what he was feeling and it was intolerable to her. And so in order to discharge that, you know, she had to judge or, um, try to make it not happen again, or, you know, so I, I mean, that's, that's, I think why it is not useful to define it that way. Um, uh, yeah. I would even be, I, I even have problems with the whole affective and cognitive empathy. Oh yeah. Say more. It, it's like, uh, I think that they're, they're very, it's very confusing. It seems that the, I've seen that the communications field is even trying to say, it's really, it's, trying to kind of do away with that. So you, you can't even differentiate is what they're saying. But uh, the way I'm seeing, you know, I've come at the empathy from, you know, Carl Rogers work, which is for me feeling into the experience of someone else. And that is the sort of the self other differentiation. So, you know, I, I, I hear where you are, like, if you if you come and you're like, in, in total pain, like, you know, your son's like, yeah, I'm in pain. So instead of me, you know, I feel that pain and, you know, I'll say, oh, are you, are you, you're hurting. And you can sort of doing that reflection of where the person is, kind of being with them sort of on their journey. And uh, they say, yeah, I hurt myself. Oh, so you fell down and, you know, kind of staying present with where that, where the other person is, be it pain or, even joy or whatever the feeling is, and sort of being present with them. And for me, that is just the essence of empathy is feeling into uh, the other person's uh, experience, their felt experience, or it could be self-empathy feeling into my own felt experience. And so for me, that would be self-empathy and just empathy. Uh, and um, what uh, you're, what, what, and even the, these terms are so confusing. This is like the, it's such a morass. I mean, it's like, I don't know if you've seen the Dan Batson article, paper, no. he has a paper, these things called empathy. And he's, he, he pretty clearly lays out eight different ways that the word is used. And he's saying there's, there's different, there's these words applied to different phenomenon, plus there's different words for the same phenomenon Plus, the, these words overlap with other phenomenon like sympathy and distress yeah. and whatever. So it's just it's such. A, so I don't even know what people are talking about to a large extent when they say empathy from the you know from the get go. But the the part yeah anyway. So the the definition and the, the phenomenon that I'm talking about is the feeling into you know as I listen I can as I speak you know I can. I am speaking, I can feel into what I'm, you know, what I'm saying is what the self-empathy and, you know, observing you, seeing, you know, your body, uh, you know, your focus, your concentration. And so I can empathize and feel into that. And then the other part I would say is there's imaginative empathy. Mm -hmm. So imaginative empathy is maybe what some people are calling cognitive empathy is that I can take the role of anything. I can take the role of, of another person. I can be, an, you know, take the role of an animal, you know, like a carrot or, you know, just anything. I can take any role. I can take the role of a feeling. Like I can say, oh, I am uh, whatever, happiness. What, and then I can have a dialogue with someone else as happiness. So I can take any role. And for me, that is uh, imaginative empathy, imagining being in that perspective, seeing the world from that perspective and tapping into my own felt experience and speaking from that uh, felt experience. 
And then the other component would be the rela relational empathy. Is that there's, a, a, there's this notion that we're in relationship with others, which you know, you've mentioned. And if we look at the empathy within the relationship, Right, it's like when somebody's in distress, there's sort of like an empathy deficit. They sort of need empathy, right? And then, um, so we're looking at the uh, not just seeing it from these different perspectives, like an individualistic perspective, but also seeing it sort of from the perspective of the full relationship and the level of empathy within that whole relationship. So that's sort of the kind of the framework yeah. that I'm looking at it. Yeah, I think in social, in the social construction field, I think they talk a lot about there is no empathy outside of relationship. And I, you know, that might be a little absolutist um, because of all the work on self-compassion and what you can, what you just called sort of self-empathy or being willing to be present with ourselves. Um, I also think there's something to that though. And I think that, like you said, it can get really complicated about how we define things. And um, it, I do think it's true. Like when I think about in my field, when I think about the word depression, when somebody sits down, I say, oh, what brings you in today? And they say, I'm depressed. That tells me almost nothing because we all have such different ideas about what that is. And so I do think there's a piece about empathy that I don't necessarily mind the kind of continued discussions about sympathy and empathy and compassion and cognitive empathy or, you know, I... I don't want to get lost in it though, because I feel like I, I wouldn't want the goal to be somehow that we're going to settle or we're going to have these things that we're going to proclaim like truth or here's what this is. I, I think that idea that it is relational in the sense that when we're using those words, it's useful to find out what are your, what's your sense of this or, or, or what, when you say that, tell me a little bit more mm -hmm. about what you're referring to, which, which you just did for me right now, you know, that sort of feeling into, and I feel like if we s sort of make our case too strongly that this is what it is and this is what it isn't, then we won't be interested anymore in finding out how is it being used in this conversation we're having right oh, now. Uh -huh. Right. Um, uh -huh. So and really so, hear where people are and how, how do they see it and kind of have a, a sense, awareness of, kind of go deeper into how people are understanding it. Yeah, what does this mean to you? Yeah, I think in the workshop we became really conscious of that, that we sort of tried to define, define what we meant when we were using that word, sort of like you just did. Like when we use this word, this is, so, this is really in general what we're speaking about, give a little more detail about that, and then say, you know, what. What are, how do you, how do you use this word? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what, what came to your mind when you saw the title of this workshop and sort of get on the table, you know, what their thoughts were, because often people would say, Oh, I really didn't want to come. Just like I said earlier, mm -hmm. I really right. didn't want to come. Like it, that's the last thing I need more of. Like, mm -hmm. it just, you know, it's too, my bag's too heavy with everybody's difficulties that I've taken on because I empathize so much with them or, um, or I've got someone sleeping on my couch right now because I feel so much for them. And so we want to help sort of unwind that so that they know that we're not going to talk about how they should give more. Mm -hmm. Because I do think also people have empathy very, very tied to particular actions. Often they'll say, if I'm empathetic, I won't say no. If I'm empathetic, I will give you whatever you ask for. If I'm empathetic, I'll take home whoever off the street into my house if I'm empathetic. I'll take home another stray cat that I actually can't effectively care for. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess that's, you know, in, in the sort of greater good science center sort of meditation, mindfulness sort of field of empathy. Um, they would sort of talk about there's sort of wise compassion or, or, you know, that's how they might talk about it. And I think the way I typically talk about it is that decisions and boundaries and limitations are not related to empathy. 
like, fe- you know, feeling into somebody's experience and trying to really connect and listen and perspective take sort of about where they are is not in any way connected to you then having to make a particular decision about loaning them money or, you know, the, the, to separate those mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. That, that, that the action all by itself is, is sort of the kindness or is the goal. Well, how about the, the part, the way I would look at it is that that would be the, the uh, sort of the culture of empathy, the relational empathy in the sense that we're, we're holding everyone's needs in that context, right? If someone's, you're saying, oh, I have to give money to this person, but there's also your own needs too that need are, are held. So that's sort of the relational part. It's just not this one way uh, you know, and I think that's the concern. It's like, it's just going to be me giving, 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 and my needs don't count. It's like all about self-sacrifice. Whereas I would say that's even, you know, that's like an empathy deficit because in that case, your own needs aren't being held. And it's really about the sort of the dialogue between the different needs getting worked out is sort of this larger kind of a context that we need to have these these dialogues say, well, you know, I don't have the money to, you know, even if I did, I don't, you know, wouldn't want to give it to you because I worked for it. But have have it be in a dialogue that, you know, work with the intention of hearing each other's deeper felt experience around it. So. I like, I really like that framing. I really like that framing because sort of in, you know, in terms of sort of generalizing in therapy, when people have great difficulty saying no, or feel a deep, um, feel like they don't even have a choice in terms of giving more than they have, whether that's emotionally or financially, or um, taking in more animals that they can care for, um, not, you know, helping family members more than they have time for, or in a way that like harms their health in a way that doesn't sort of honor their own needs. Um, You know, it does, it does seem like it's often, and of course this is my field, so I'm more apt to see things in this, in this light, but it does, it often seems like it stems from a family of origin where the parental sort of figures did not indicate to the, to children that their needs were important or should be held equally with others needs like you were talking about there wasn't any modeling for sort of either either showing that yes your needs can be held w- with others needs we can hold all of them together and so they sort of grow up with this you know deep devaluation of mm-hmm. of their own needs yeah sometimes unable to recognize them even you know um that's sort of the first step is recognizing them and then being able to uh attribute value to them and say i can mm-hmm. actually decisions based on this and articulate them even and share them and have space for them feeling being heard and seen and acknowledged yeah yeah like that whole process well that's that's what i would call the culture of empathy is that and it's not only from an individualist in the sense that you know i have needs as well as you do but can we have can we have an agreement or an intention that we want a mutually empathic relationship that it's not just about me creating this relationship. That's a bit of the political aspect you know, I'm seeing is, you know, as we put it out there and say, we want this as a social value that, that everybody's needs and uh, experience uh, matters, but there's, there, it, it's sort of a reciprocal, a mutual, a mutual empathy. We can create that mutual empathic uh, environment. And I think that's what, you know, it just takes training and practice to, to do that. Like with my own family, I mentioned they were conservative, you know, I was kind of progressive and we had <laughs> butt heads a lot and uh, they didn't understand the work I was doing, you know, with empathy. And then once uh, several years ago, I don't know how long, five years ago or six, that there was a conflict in my family where two family members were fighting with each other you know, during Christmas and uh, over where they, some gifts had been kept uh, and the kids had gotten into them, who was responsible for that. So it was my sister-in-law and mother were kind of going at each other 
And I was able to start listening to both of them, right? To, to listen to one, which, you know, until she felt heard, then went to the next person, you know, in real time there in the living room. And then listening to the other person until they feel heard and kind of going back and forth. Yeah. And to the point where I, they started, you know, feeling heard, started uh, calming down enough. And I said, would you now listen to the other person and reflect back like I did to you what they're saying until they feel heard. And then it will be your turn to take a turn and you will be fully have a chance to feel fully heard. And I said, oh, OK, we'll, we'll try it. And, you know, and I had to kind of keep them on track because someone would say something and the other would want to like fight. And I said, no, no, wait a minute. Just reflect back, you know, what they're saying. and You'll get your chance to be fully heard. It started going uh, back and forth like that. And then the whole family kind of came. Uh, who they all been hiding, right? Kind of in the, in the corners. <laughs> and they came into the circle. And it turned into this whole family empathy circle. You know, one person speaking, going back and forth. And then what surfaced was like, a much deeper kind of an issue, which was one of the family members not feeling like she belonged, was not accepted. And when that was sort of surfaced, there was this, you know, father came out and said, oh, you know, you belong and appreciate, you know, and love you and all this, and you know, big hugs. And it kind of ended with, you know, really sense of connection and kind of resolution to this conflict. And so that was like this pivotal moment in, in our family like, oh, and then I said, oh, and this is empathy, right? <laughs> it's like I kind of put the name to it, and they said, oh, this is pretty good. You know, this, is, this worked, you know, and it had, you know, positive consequences. And then after that, my sister and sister-in-law, who had been having conflict for, you know, like eight years, they were willing to have like an empathy circle, you know, mediation, you know, on a separate topic. And then we've had sort of these family empathy circles, you know, going you know, forward periodic and to the point where my sister and sister-in-law, they, they had an issue with the turtle and my sister was taking care of the tortoise for their family when they were gone and she lost it. And mm -hmm. the sister-in-law was all mad and they were going to do an empathy circle about this. And I said, oh, you want me to help you with that? And they said, no, we got it covered. We know how to do this. <laughs> so they're, they're now doing their own kind of empathy circles. So that's kind of like, how, how I see it is, you know, if we can teach these skills and these practices, and especially like in families, you know, that people can just kind of do this. And so we've also been trying to do that with, across the political divide. So I've even moved from the po political to say, I'm not progressive or conservative. I'm kind of in the empathy movement. You know, it's sort of this stepping out of, the, of that whole political and just saying that we also need to transform the society in the same way, the political realm, like with that family empathy circle, if we can move towards a more empathy-based uh, society that, you know, that's what we, we uh, want to work towards. And so. That is, you must feel so good about the work you were able to share with your family and the fact that they picked that up themselves you know, in a really meaningful way yeah. and were able to forward themselves too with it. It was transformational. It was like, it was like, the, and it was so scary to do it. I mean, it was, I was like terrified to kind of step I into was. this. And it was like, I was like had icicles, you know, in my, in the core of my body, just to kind of step in with an empathic presence to kind of hold this. It's because it can be pretty scary about how are things going to blow up, but then, you know, afterwards, it just felt like, oh, this is, you know, it was a, just like a peak, pivotal moment, I think, for our family. So, yeah, and I, I see that there is the potential out there for, you know, the work that we're doing. I also, I think it's too, the example is, um, it's so much about when relationships have tears or wounds, if we are able to repair, then those relationships are typically stronger than if they hadn't had the wound. And this, this is true also in uh, the, the research on therapeutic alliance, that if, uh, if you come to see me as a therapist and 
I sort of wound you, even if it's kind of what we would call a, a micro wound, even by your mm-hmm. perspective. You know, I sort of don't hear uh-huh. you. Uh-huh. Or, you know, um, pass over something that you would hoped I would have picked up was important or um, if you come back or if I'm able to repair that before the end and say, you know, I feel, I feel like I sort of missed, (laughs) you know, this piece that you shared. I felt like I was sort of dismissive about it. And I'm wondering if that's really important to you. And Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. did you feel dismissed, you know, Um, then typically our relationship will be actually be stronger than if that hadn't happened. And so when you're describing, you know, in your family, this, this conflict, and then the reparation of that, um, and it sounds like it created even stronger relationships. So I think it's, um, it's just so hopeful about repairing that it's not even repairing to where things were before that it's actually, you know, the relationships can be stronger. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I hadn't thought of it so that, uh, you you the the healing that repairing that you kind of know oh there's a pathway out of future problems is there there is a way that things will come up and that there is a pathway through it so that that adds a whole layer of of uh ease and you know hopefulness and comfort safety out of it too yeah so where do you see your work going like uh with you've got that training you've developed uh you're holding that those trainings uh how how do you see where what direction do you see going right, you know right now i'm in uh or just applied for a doctoral program so sort of one piece i feel like where i'm going myself i guess personally or professionally is that i study the impact of receptionists who had been given resources to really practice these skills that we're talking about. And then we measured the impact on patient experience. And we extrapolated that because there was such a dramatic increase in patient experience, improvement in patient experience, that that related to patient outcomes, because we know from other literature that those two things are closely related. And that was sort of a practice-based on-site, you know, research that I was doing when I worked there. And so this uh, doctorate that I've applied for, um, it's a European university, so you, you know, start your doctoral work immediately. So you have to have a very fleshed out proposal in the application. And I was proposing to really study this with more rigor and, um, and with more of a social construction bent. Because I think five years ago when I was doing this work, I focused on, I really focused on kind of a little bit more traditionally sort of training, I guess, which is a word. I'm actually taking it out of my business name and trying to kind of avoid using just because it has such sort of passive implications, you know, and sort of expert implications. Mm -hmm. And so I wrestle with that word. Um, But I, I sort of was more focused traditionally in a way on sort of getting them to get their skills up and then measuring the impact on patients. And, and, and now what I'd really like to do is really um, share this, this, this sort of learning and practice with receptionists and really spend some time exploring their experience of it. So what's their experience you know, of, of um, how they grew up and how the workplace has sort of been for them? And what's their experience of um, using these skills more, like real, focus more on their experience. I, I feel like I didn't focus enough on their experience and I've evolved more to think about um, that that's as deeply important to the research as the impact on patients and sort of equalizing patients and um, staff in, mm-hmm. in terms of importance. And then, and then also studying the patient experience and patient health outcomes. So I'm really f- focused on that in terms of doctoral research. And then I think um, in California, the empathy effect is getting increasingly utilized. Um, and so I'm really wanting to, like right now, we have sort of a, a fellowship or a cohort of trainers who are out there and they've been for the last six months doing workshops in their communities, not just within their organizations, because we really wanted them to open up to other people in the community so that relationships and partnerships with could happen within the workshop because it t- people tend to get really vulnerable and there are relationships built. 
And so like at the end of this month, I have another webinar with them to sort of hear about their experience and provide any sort of support we can provide. And um, so I feel like I, I'm going to follow that for the next year for sure, just to see how are these facilitators that we've trained doing in their communities doing this. And um, we do get a lot of uh, feedback from the participants as well as the facilitators. So we have some data we can kind of mine too. Um, and then some of the other consulting work that I do, I try to bring this into, well, it is in, in all the consulting work I do, but this other, or I shouldn't say, but you know what, just a minute. I'm sorry. Dashiell? I think I lost. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, and so I think the other piece is I work with um, health plans now, which is sort of, they're not providing direct care, they're insurance companies. I'm working with managed care Medicaid health plans, so they're nonprofits. They're administering the insurance benefit to anybody who has Medicare or Medicaid. And um, so I feel like by working with them, it's another way I provide consultation on how they're treating their employees. Are their workplaces cultures of empathy? Because there's typically been this sort of rigid separation in health plans where they might get a very traditional customer service training and it may or be, it might not bear any relationship to how they feel treated. Like there's no acknowledgement of the parallel process that if you want people on the phone to be connected and kind, um, then that's how they also need to be treated at the organization. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that's a direction that I've been going for a few years of really making that connection and working with organizations around their own cultures internally with their own employees. Um, before they get too focused on how they want their employees to act uh, or what they want their employees to do. Um, so I feel like that, that piece too is really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. It is that no, larger. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm oh. going to have to go in just okay, a Okay. Yeah. Sorry. we kind of went a lot longer than I just can. I can talk about this for hours and hours. Me too. It's really great but to talk to you. We can, yeah. get to, we can get together another time to kind of follow up. Um, if you, so. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. I really so. appreciate talking to you. I feel like um, many of the things you said from like the people you mentioned or some of the, the books you mentioned and some of the ways you frame things are things I hadn't thought about before, hadn't heard of before. So it's really fun for me um, to be able to have new things come in that I can then explore. So I appreciate that. Yeah, likewise. And also someone that's very enthusiastic about the topic too. It's like, it's a lot of fun to... Yeah kind of exchange notes and especially the training, you know, maybe talk more about like how your training works uh, and, you know, that notion of the cultures of empathy, like what I was hearing is, you know, it, it takes a whole environment for the, like the people who are working at the front desk that kind of, how are they being treated? And it even is, what is their home life like? What is the, you know, the patients coming? What are their, empathic environments that they're coming from so it's a whole kind of a larger relational kind of aspect and how do we sort of foster you know more empathy in, in all those different uh environments so um well with that i should yeah i'll end it uh, there unless you have something final to say and we'll maybe schedule another time to follow up well i'd love to talk again and um i just thank you for the work that you're doing I think it's really important and um, thank you. And like